My name is uh, Raquel Aguillar Ibáñez. I'm a senior director as part of the Global um, Outcomes Research Team focused in oncology as part of MSD. I'm delighted here today to welcome you to this panel um, discussion focused on enabling the adoption of R in healthcare decision making. One point to note is that an important consideration when we decide what so when industry decides what the type of software to use for HTA submissions is, of course, um, looking at what software agencies are going to allow us to submit. So uh, this is one of the very important points to, to take into account. A challenge for us is if very if only very few agencies are allowing the use of R, then because all the others probably are going to be asking for other types of software such as Excel, there may be less opportunities to use um, to use R for those HTA um, cost effectiveness models. So to gain a better understanding of the intersectoral opportunities and the challenges that agencies are facing uh, in relation to the use of R for HTA modeling purposes, we have here today the privilege of um, having a panel, a very distinguished group of panelists, each of them bringing a unique and um, unique expertise and experiences working across different HTA agencies. With this, let me actually introduce you our first panelist, Dr. Kale Oltonen. Kale is a senior specialist in health economics at the Finnish Pharmaceutical Pricing Board in Finland. Uh, Kale is pharmacist by training and he started working on, on the Finnish Pharmaceutical Pricing Board after he finished his PhD at the University of Helsinki. His research interest focuses on statistical programming and health economics. He studied extensively the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of biologic drugs in rheumatic diseases using observational data. And actually, just to mention that Kale is an R user since 2012, so <laughs> some time ago already. Our next panelist is Dr. Uh, Natalia Kunst. She is a senior advisor at the Norwegian Directorate of Health, and she is also an associate professor at the University of Oslo. Her interests focus on uncertainty and evidence in decision analytic modeling and health economic evaluation. And I hear that she is very well versed in the in value of information analysis, precision medicine, and health disparities. Next, we have Dr. Anders Viverg. Uh, he is a senior analyst at the Dental and Pharmaceutical Benefits Agency, in, or known, uh, better known as TLV in Sweden. He holds a PhD in pharmacometrics from Uppsala University, and he brings a very broad and special perspective because previously to joining the TLV, he worked in industry and also in consultancy as part of a CRO. So his work focuses on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and he has extensive experience using R to integrate different data sources in health economic evaluations. And then now let me uh, also mention um, our finally, but not least, uh, panelist is Dr. Arthur White. He is an assistant professor in statistics at the School of Computer Science and Statistics in Trinity College, Dublin. And he's also a statistician at the National Center for Pharmacoeconomics in Ireland. His research interests include Bayesian statistics and medical applications. He has written an R package to perform latent class analysis, and he also has been involved in the development of several other packages for much adjusted indirect comparisons and survival analysis. So let me uh, now take a closer look at the agenda. In the next 15 minutes, uh, next uh, 15 minutes approximately, or actually a little bit less now, uh, we are going to be focusing first on the barriers to adopt R, then we'll be discussing the opportunities that R can bring to increase efficiency in HTA, in HTA modeling. We will then move to talk about the role that R can play beyond cost effectiveness models for HTA purposes. And finally, we also want to briefly discuss with the panel the views regarding the use of 
artificial intelligence to develop the required code for R. We'll end up at the end some, with some concluding remarks from the panel, and we'll have also some minutes for questions from the audience. So with this, let me just quickly say that um, uh, the views and uh, the, the views and opinions that we are going to be presenting here by the panelists and by myself are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our organizations, just as an upfront disclaimer here. So let me actually move to the very first question that we want to pose to the panelists uh, today. So uh, from the perspective of the agency and, and thinking about a broad perspective, so the agency, the professionals working on it that may have different uh, levels of, um, they, they may be at different stages in their career. Uh, what are the main barriers in the adoption of R for HTA related cost effectiveness models? And with this, actually, I would like to uh, start with Kale. Kale, if you don't mind taking this first question as the first speaker, Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can, you. I hope you can understand me despite of my recent code and my thick accent. Um, but to get to, to, to get to the point, I think obviously the greatest barrier in adapting the R in, in the HDA is the unfamiliarity of the people working for the HDA agencies, but also for the uh, people in the market access positions in the pharmaceutical industry who, who we collaborate with. Uh, learning R is not an easy task for a person with no prior programming or statistical background. And uh, since there haven't been any submissions in R for us at least, the incentive for investing the time to learn R is not, uh, hasn't been there yet. And uh, an easy solution would be to hire people with previous R backgrounds such as myself, but I found that they are not always easy to come by and the R programming is not the only skill that we are looking for. Uh, I think to overcome this, we could uh, retain some familiarity with uh, for the non-R non users by using Excel as a user interface for the R and only use the R as the model engine. Of course, the Shiny could uh, serve equal purpose, but it should be editable for the end user. I think my colleagues agree that uh, we are more, like, more likely to trust something that we can edit and understand by ourselves rather than a black box that's not accessible to us. And the code needs to be well documented and transparent and it's very, very important for the new user to understand what's happening. So the, it should be very simplistic explained in the comments. I'm not someone who could boast by telling you that I document everything that I write in R very well. I've learned that the hard way that when I try to explain something to my PhD students and there's no comments, it's difficult to remember, difficult to exp explain that. So I really uh, encourage you to document everything in a very straightforward manner. And naming the variables could also w w uh, help to achieve the same goal. So many times naming of the columns in Excel helps to uh, convey the message that you are, uh, what, what's their purpose? So using uh, reasonable, rational for naming the variables and objects in R could, could be important. And uh, as I mentioned, the code should be editable and you, the submission should include the objects required to run the code. So that's not, it's not just uh, so a text file that doesn't allow the user to manipulate it. And um, 
maybe we could get some insight into how the R, R models work if there were some available online, for example, a repository for uh, open source R models that could be used as a starting points for training and creating a new models could be very welcome. And uh, furthermore, I would like to say that there are interest among the HDI bodies for uptaking R and uh, this is uh, backed up by the working group we have among the HDI uh, people, people working for the HDA, HDA agencies uh, to promote the uptake of R, but it's not to say that that includes every single person working for the HDI bodies, but maybe just the people with most uh, enthusiasm towards statistical programming. These are all excellent points. Thank you so much, Kale. So it's very clear that, of course, the familiarity and the skills have to be there, but then there has to be very transparent documentation available and open source models. So thank you so much for your comments. I would like to move next to Natalia, if you don't mind uh, taking the question as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Raquel. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction and also for inviting me uh, to this panel. I guess I should also start with um just mentioning that i haven't been working in the reimbursement body uh in norway but i uh, do have uh, experience from all the sectors the industry academia and uh, as well as the government but it's the part of the ministry uh, but i did talk with my colleagues from the reimbursement body as well uh about this uh, uh these topics uh so uh, just building on what Kale said, I think in uh, in my uh, opinion, one of the main barriers is the fact that um, in the current practice, the manufacturers develop a global model, which they uh, thereafter distribute to all countries. And the companies have a global team, which consists of experts in, uh, in modeling. So uh, because of that, their employees in each country have to be able to adapt the model to their country settings, but they do not need to have strong modeling skills very often. And here models in Excel may be easier to be adapted um, by people who do not have expertise in, uh, in modeling. Uh, another point which also Carl mentioned uh, is uh, about the training. Um, so here I think that many health economists uh, who work in HCA bodies, um, pharmaceutical companies and uh, consulting companies, um, they learned modeling in Excel. Uh, and many universities still teach health economic evaluation and modeling in Excel. Um, and even though this is changing also in our courses at the University of uh, Oslo, uh, where I have been uh, teaching, we have started to teach in both Excel and R, uh, so that the, that the students are kind of exposed to both of the software, but we do see that still Excel is still being used the most, so like they should have also skills in, uh, in, Excel, so in, in Excel when uh, they go uh, on the job market. Um, and um, uh, because of that, I think the, the in, these institutions uh, like HDA bodies and uh, the companies, the pharmaceutical companies and consulting companies um, would need to invest in training uh, their employees so that they would develop skills in modeling in our software. Um, and some employees may be hesitant to that change as well. That varies uh, depending on the personality. Uh, and uh, lastly, I would like to also mention that from the governmental perspective, there is usually a structured process for reviewing and documenting HDA and uh, um, submitted uh, models. And this process would need to be adjusted as well. And the same would apply to the industry. Um, there is quite a lot of bureaucracy, uh, both in the government and in the industry. So I guess it would require quite some effort as well to make that change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Really important points as well about the, the fact that uh, we need to think about a global perspective and that maybe doesn't 
truly match with uh, the requirements in each country and the fact that the training already has to start from the university. So well done, actually, um, at your end, already training students in, in art. Thank, thank you so much for your comments. I'd like to move now to Anders, so I'll give you now the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks a lot for inviting me to this session. Um, it's really a, a privilege to share my thoughts and get your thoughts uh, in return. So, first of all, TLV has no restrictions in what software that can be used for developing a health economy model. So you are fully uh, capable of submitting a model in R, and we will, we will evaluate that model. When it comes to us, I believe the threshold um, is culture. There's a culture to use Excel within the health economy. I did a switch from R&D uh, in industry when coming to TLB, and I was surprised that Excel was still used. Uh, I don't know any other quantitative science where Excel is the main software that is used for model development. So I think it's a culture thing. And that's something that we can, can overcome together. I believe from a governmental perspective, we might need to change the way we evaluate models. Right, right now, I think most health economists, they go into the code and look, okay, what is that, does that code in the Excel document actually do? and try to understand the model. And from my perspective, I don't think it's necessary to exactly understand the code. What you need to understand is what the code is actually doing. You need to see what output will I get from this model? And it doesn't really matter how it's coded. Uh, and thinking that, that it's a black box when you go into R, I don't fully agree there. And mainly because I, <laughs> I know some R. But even if I don't know R, I can still evaluate the model by seeing the output, seeing the tracer, make sure that you can output every important step and tabulate and visually uh, in graphs um, see what the model is actually doing in each step. And I believe that no health economist can evaluate all Excel macros available in all health, health economy, economy models. So I believe, I believe that knowing some R will make it much more easy and more transparent to evaluate the model. You know. But I, need, I think we need to change the culture. Uh, I think we need to change the way we, we evaluate the models. Uh, and from there on, um, I think the sky is the limit. So I just challenge you, please send us, send us some R models and we can make this change together. And with that, no, I sir. leave the Thank you so much, Sanders. Those are really great points, and and I really um, love the fact that you you've mentioned to overcome this barrier altogether. So I think we have to work all together towards uh, that um, enabling in the use of R. And actually, that very very important point of not uh, not for everyone to need to understand exactly the code, but more the results of the model. So maybe that's another point of discussion that we can take over later in terms of what sort of information we will need to, to provide for that. But now I would like to, uh, to move to Arthur also to get your views on this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it's it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to participate in the panel and to hear everybody else's thoughts. It's been already, you know, we're like five minutes in. It's been a very interesting discussion for me already. Um, personally, I, I, re I really think the other points of view have been very interesting and, and I've made some really good points. Um, so I kind of won't repeat all of those too much. I mean, maybe just two other points to consider would be one. I think this kind of point has already been made, but I suppose from our point of view, I mean, within our group, within the NCPE, who, the people who perform the health technology assessments, um, it's quite a, a broad skill set. So we have some people who are quite, quite technical and would have kind of strong quantitative backgrounds in, you know, mathematics or, or, or statistics or, or in health economics. And um, so for, for them, I think, you know, they'd be really interested to see something in or um, speaking to you very personally, I actually really don't enjoy interacting with the spreadsheet at all. I find it very frustrating and cumbersome. So I actually prefer to read something in or if it was remotely well coded. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that my, all of my colleagues will feel exactly that way. But of course, then within our group thing, you know, obviously it's pharmacoeconomics, it's a multi, it's, it's interdisciplinary field. 
there are other people who are working in this area and you know i mean so i think that, you know and they, they have kind of different qualities and different skills so i think certainly the currently the way that we set do perform hca is as a team um, you know, with, with different people having roles, responsibilities. So if we saw a submission in or, which we haven't really today, I don't think apart from some, you know, very specific cases that I, I'm not too sure about the specifics of, um, then how we would engage and behave as a team would have to change. So there'd be a, a kind of, uh, you know, um, as Anders was saying, the kind of culture, even internally our own culture about how we would perform it, share would have to change. So, so there, there will be, there would, that would take some time. Um, and then, I mean, the other point I was going to make is, again, maybe, um, a, a quite a mundane one but maybe maybe kind of a practical one and again this comes from our side but you know the ncp is, is situated within the irish um, health service and the irish health service um, I, I don't know how if everybody on the call is aware of this but uh, it was kind of in the news last year but uh, the, the health service suffered a, a, a very serious ransomware attack uh, last year uh, which means that essentially all it services across the board are under kind of high alert so just to kind of give you an example now if you use a machine in in um in the Irish healthcare system, if you if you try and go on to GitHub.com, you'll have your access prevented because that's sort of seen as an external website and things like that. So there would have to be some practical elements in terms of how we actually, you know, if you saw an HMA submission, it was an or it says, oh yeah, we use packages A, B, and C, and you don't have package C installed. You know, the steps to actually install that package wouldn't be straightforward in that situation, which is maybe a surprise, right? Because you know, from the academic side, you know, there, there's no there's no issues there at all. Uh, certainly in my experience right so, so 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 that would have to be i mean there's probably solutions around that but those would need to be kind of discussed and uh, a little bit maybe as well so it's just another thing to consider uh, and thank you so much arthur for all the points but i find very interesting the one about the thinking about the, downloading those our packages and having troubles with that so that's something that maybe not everyone is aware of so thank you so much for sharing um great let's now move to the next question if the computer allows me to do so. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I would like to discuss now with the panel is what are the main opportunities in using R to increase efficiency in HTA? So we've been discussing some, some challenges, also actually some possibilities of overcoming them, um, but in terms of opportunities, so how do you see the opportunities that R brings uh, to, to those HTA models. And for this one, actually, I'm going to start with Natalia. So the floor is yours, Natalia. Thank you, Akel. Uh, so I can see several opportunities. And first, in my opinion, once the reviewer is familiar with R, I think that it may be easier to review a model in R. And this is especially the case for more comprehensive models. Uh, so the chances of making errors in models developed in Excel are, uh, are pretty high and debugging the, the model is substantially easier in R, at least in my opinion. Um, next, um, I think that R facilitates the development of uh, more comprehensive models and developing this type of more comprehensive models is not always necessary, but in some cases, it may help with making a more uh, precise evaluation. Uh, another um, opportunity um, is perhaps that pharmaceutical companies may develop templates to systematize and uh, improve the efficiency of the model development process. And actually, this could be as well in the HTA bodies when it comes to reviewing the, the models, that it could be easier, I think, to create templates um, for the review. Um, I also think that creating an uh, infrastructure to use R would be beneficial. Uh, perhaps the stakeholders, and here I'm involved, the HCA bodies and uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, should start with having like a small team specialized in modeling in R, who would also help uh, the other colleagues uh, to become more familiar with our software. Um, next opportunity is uh, about replicating Excel models in R, and I think that could be an option. I think it would help the HTA bodies and health economists uh, who are responsible for adapting the models to their country settings to gain skills in modeling in R. It may also help in uh, appreciating the benefits of uh, modeling in R. 
Um, however, I think that for this to happen, uh, some incentives for pharmaceutical companies would be needed uh, as they would need to develop uh, two models instead of one in Excel. Um, and finally, um, I think that our Shiny uh, would be very user friendly. Um, although I believe that HTA bodies uh, prefer to have access to the model um, to be able to validate it as well and to dig into that and uh, make some changes themselves as well, at least in, uh, in Norway that happens uh, pretty, pretty often. Um, so here perhaps including or submitting both the R Shiny as well as the uh, model itself you know, developed in R could be an option. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. These again are very important points. So I, I really like the idea of the incremental approach so that you can upskill people to, to really learning, uh, learning those skills and the fact that there should be, a, and actually there is, but maybe more oriented uh, open resources, these templates that can help companies develop those, uh, those models. So um, one, one important point that maybe we can think about and the, the rest of the panelists will be great if any one of you can comment is, you mentioned about the comprehensive uh, models. I wonder whether there are some specific areas where are maybe more suited to be used, like it can be, uh, Therapeutic areas, so it can be specific um, specific types of models that need to be implemented. So with this, I thank you again, Natalia. I'm going to move uh, to our uh, next uh, panelist. In this case, I will ask Anders to provide your views uh, related to this question. Thank you. Thank you. From my perspective, I would say that the main opportunity with R is the track record. You have traceability. Quite frankly, when you have an Excel model, the traceability sucks. It's so easy not knowing what actually happened. If you have a script-based model, you actually know what happened. You can have an output file where all the parameter estimates and, and the model is actually written down with a timestamp. So you know what when you produced some kind of ISO or quality, this is actually what fed the model. Uh, I think we can have better output. We can standardize in a, a much better way. Um, I believe that the agencies, we need to come up with some kind of guidelines, probably, eventually. Uh, I don't think TLV is ready for that yet. But eventually, I think we need to have standards for how the output looks like. Because it's going to be the output that we evaluate, in, not the, the, the model. I believe having some kind of shiny interface on an R model will make the model much easier to run as compared to Excel. You can clearly define what endpoint or what variables should be adjustable and what should be fixed. And you have that in the model because I don't think any agency is really that eager to go into an Excel macro and adjust the macro. But what we want to do is to adjust some assumptions, pivotal assumptions in the model. And that is something that you often can do if you have an R and shiny interface. Uh, and I believe, I mean, the efficiency in R is much, much better as compared to Excel uh, in runtimes. But coming back to my first comment, I think the main opportunity is the traceability, comparing how a regulatory submission looks like, how you trace everything when it goes to GLP and GCP uh, and how a regulatory submission looks like. Uh, it's very different as compared to how, the, how we have a, a track record in a health economy model. So I believe a script-based software um, will be much easier to have a track record. And with that, I leave. Uh, Thank, over you to so the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anders. Very important points about traceability and definitely about maybe identifying those uh, outputs up front that we can use some user-friendly interfaces, but the outputs have to be clearly identified up front. So thank you so much uh, for, for sharing all these, uh, all these points. 
Uh, I'm going to move now to our next speaker. I mean, uh, now what I'm uh, I'm going to to give the floor to Arthur. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose one benefit I think was being touched on already would be the, the computational efficiency. So you'd expect something in order to run better, uh, to, to run quicker than it would be in, in Excel. Um, I, 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 sometimes what we see then as well, though, is, is if something needs to be sped up, then, you know, I guess there'll be a macro or something, there'll be something coded in the back end that'll be coded in Visual Basic. So, I mean, something like that is actually very hard to scrutinize. And like if that was implemented in or that would probably be much easier to assess and, 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 and to see how well it was doing. I guess kind of as a related point, um, I, I think what the other two speakers have mentioned is this idea of, of kind of um, kind of standardizing practice and kind of um, probably related to that then would be, and, and, and kind of, you know, this idea of having something script based um, and being kind of standardized, I mean, kind of related to that then, I guess, is is the, the idea of particularly probably in, in like you're sort of, I think you indicated already, Raquel, in, in terms of problem areas, so, so areas where there is more interest we could have these kind of standard packages that we could use um, um, and potentially, you know, the, the, and there's an appeal there too, right? Because if, if there's a kind of standard, you know, kind of consensus package out there for, for specific kind of models that we use or, or, or suites of packages that could be used, then that, that also speeds everything up, right? Because we're, we're kind of clear about how, you know, what's being implemented and how it's been implemented. So, you know, you've got a kind of, almost like a global model that everyone kind of agrees that they're kind of the, the base what they're doing on um so, so something like that could be really appealing i think there's been something in this area already um a little bit some some kind of in, uh, some in the open source value project it's not something i know a huge amount about but it's probably something that, that could be worth uh, investigating more um, and then i guess the last point would be um so, so those are kind of all general benefits of using or but i think also in terms of the h you know in terms of the models that we see there are specific models where they are kind of a, a little bit limited in terms of how they can be implemented in Excel themselves, right? So there's probably certain models where if you started to implement them in R directly, the, the level of sophistication would really increase. Not only would it like run faster, but it would just be a better model full stop, right? So I think kind of multi-state models would be one example of that, where I think at the moment, we're, you know, it's, using Excel is a real handbrake on, on how those are actually going to get implemented in, in, a, in a health economic setting. So, so something in that direction where, you know, I mean, that, 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 that would really be an incentive to use or because you could get a much clearer understanding of, of, of the value of, of the benefit of, of, of the drug. These are great points again, Arthur. Thank you so much for that. So there's clarity, there's clear um, optimal use in some specific types of models. And, and actually, I think we, we need to think about these standardized models. For example, if we think about some of the packages that are up there, I think some of them maybe better accepted than than some others like i think in general flex serve uh, is going to be very well accepted while if you think about hesim or if you think about hemod those may be a little bit more questionable in some cases so it's really good to to hear your points and and for us to think about those standardized packages and specific uses in in some type of uh, modeling area so thank you i'm going to move now to uh Kale um for your views on this question thank you thank you uh before i joined here at the pharmaceutical pricing board i did some modeling myself and i really found that the, the predict function in r was really convenient way to move the results of regression analysis to extrapolation and uh, that was a very convenient way to use regression modeling in a patient level simulation model. Which brings me to the to answer your question. I think the benefits of R could be uh, realized first in patient level models, which are very computationally intensive using Excel and uh, maybe somewhat uh, cumbersome to review and to code. And uh, patient level simulation models are most useful in disease areas where there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, relating to the patient characteristics that affect the results of the uh, cost effectiveness model. And uh, those could be, those patient characteristics could be, for example, the number of annual exacerbations of asthma, for example, which in effect would be translated into the reimbursement criteria. So uh, this, this, I think 
first we should use R for something that's it's really has really strong benefits against Excel. So if we start by doing something that's simply enough done in Excel as well, the people working for uh, HDI bodies could say that I could do that in Excel. Why do I have to bother to learn R? So the first experience for the HDI modelers, uh, or I mean the HDA assessors working for the HDA bodies should be something that impresses them, to, uh, them, them by seeing that I couldn't have done that in Excel or must really be something else. And uh, I fully agree with the previous speakers related to the standardiza standardizations. So uh, we were previously talking about that there was a talk about uh, making your own R packages and that's really inspiring and could teach you really something about making recording R but in terms of um, standardization it might not be the best fit for uh, HDA submissions. I think we should use peer-reviewed packages that we can all agree on and the models would be easier to uh, interpret from one, from one model to another. Thank you so much, Kalle. <laughs> thank you. Excellent points uh, again. And thank you so much for pointing out the, the therapeutic areas where you think this, uh, this can be really used. So it's clear that in those areas where there's more complexity, heterogeneity, the uh, R is going to be a really, a really good uh, software to to use and then uh, that point about the validation of the packages uh, to be used in in hta so uh, very important points all, all the points that you made and and i got particularly these two so thank you let's now move actually to our next question and the next one is um about your views on the um actually i think i went too far <laughs> Uh, uh, what's what's the additional role that uh, you think R can have beyond the HTA related cost effectiveness models? So for this question, actually, I'm going to start with Anders. Yes, I work at the analysis department at TLV, and we do not only health economy, we support uh, the assessors who, who evaluate the health economy, but we do a, a lot of other types of analysis, like the pharmacy market. We supervise the pharmacy market, and we look at, at uh, costs of pharmaceutical products and, and so on. And our bread and butter software is R. So that is what we are using for our analysis. And I believe it's much. It's very useful for data management, for example. Um, it's useful for incorporating different data sources. And that's how I think we will more and more evaluate health economy models. We will use real world data from, for example, the comparator. We want to integrate different types of data sources. And there I think R is very good um, at incorporating different data sources. We use R for estimations. All the survival curves, most of the survival curves are actually estimated um, from R or SAS or whatever software, and then you incorporate it into Excel. What if we can use one software for the estimations and model development? I think using R for several different purposes makes it easier to switch between uh, different uh, uh, data sources. And that's one of the reasons why I think R and it's, it's a very good software for continuing. And there I leave. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anders. Very important, uh, very important points, particularly now that we are having more and more access to electronic health records and real world data in general. That sort of integration of data analysis with the modeling, it's a, it's a great opportunity and it's a great use beyond just using R in mo for modeling purposes. I think it's happening in some way. Uh, actually, probably R is being used very much on that data analysis, maybe a little bit less in the modeling, but there's this opportunity for the integration. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'm going to move now to Arthur to get your views on this question. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, so SOAR is, 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 is many potential uses. I mean, in the NCP, um, we carry out our own research. So, so some of that is kind of method methodology driven. So we have people who have expertise in things like network meta analysis. There are people who have specializations and specialties, whether they use OR to inform the modeling that they're doing there. Um, we'll also use OR um, in terms of things like we'll kind of review our own practices. So we'll kind of look back and see over, you know, over a certain number of years of submissions, you know, what kinds of submissions are we seeing? Are we seeing an increase with certain kinds of therapies versus other kinds of therapies? So there's, there's real value in any group learning or I would say I'll, I'll be a huge advocate for doing that um, in, in kind of in, in that respect for sure. Um, I guess the other place where there's opportunities would be in, in terms of these kind of database management in terms of kind of managing data. So often with, with health, uh, in, in the health system, you can have like, you know, kind of big registries of data and things like that. We actually don't do very much of that uh, with the NCP. I think potentially, very broadly speaking, um, the Irish Health Service is maybe a little bit behind. Certainly say, I mean, our peers in the UK, for example, maybe I would have a, a, a clearer sense of what, what's out there in terms of just how well managed the data is, how easy it is to access the kind of overall quality of the data. So when we, we some people in a group sometimes do get access to data, but it takes a long time. It's, it's kind of a, a very drawn out process. But obviously that would be one place where it would be great to have information about, um, you, you know, if, if you could draw on that and use that information to, to help inform um, um, aspects of the of the HDN to give a kind of broader sense of the context, um, that would be very valuable. Um, maybe just one last point to make is just, um, one thing we've kind of been investigating is, is, is you, you know, it can kind of open new opportunities to a few, uh, to, right? So, so, you know, the more you learn about something, the, the, the more opportunities that there are, right? So, so one thing that we've been kind of investigating, which I think could be very interesting, would be um, for like systematic literature reviews, which are very, very time consuming uh, currently. And um, one kind of consideration there is, um, you know, using sort of some of the natural language processing tools that are available using things like OR and Python to kind of help facilitate that process it's not going to replace the process or anything like that but you know i mean it's just uh, currently there's a huge body volume of, of material that needs to be read manually and things like that so 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 th th there's lots of different ways it's, it's a short answer you know to to, to, to how you, you can expand what you're doing excellent points again thank you so much arthur i think i, I really love the the example that you gave about uh, really following up with those submissions over time and then this last point about systematic reviews and being able to automate those tasks that cannot be done, uh, that can be more automated and don't need uh, that sort of human aspect into it. So thank you so much. I'm going to move uh, now to Kale. Thank you. Um, we don't do a lot of in-house data analysis. And uh, most of the time, the companies could not even share the data with us owing to the data privacy and research permissions. But uh, using R Markdown as a way to communicate the analysis steps could be a very nice addition to the to our current situation where we only get like a set of data or uh, 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 results from an observational data or real world evidence. And uh, if we are going to learn R to review the models, then we could also take that same knowledge and uh, review the analysis and data management steps that have been used to produce the set results from the observational studies. And uh, I think that uh, the ability to use the same knowledge for different steps of the process, as Anders previously said, could be a real benefit for the review process, starting from the data to the result of the model all the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kale. I, I think it's uh, definitely very important to emphasize that aspect of integration across different types of analysis and the opportunities actually to uh, be able to use it across the whole review process. So thank you for bringing this up. I, I would li like to mention just one point that you've mentioned in the past, which is to use the right tool for the right job. So I think it's a, it's a good point where, uh, where uh, we can uh, really focus, just identifying where it's going to be making more sense 
um, to, to you, sir. So thank you. Um, I'm going to move now to, to Natalia so that you, we can get your views on this question as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. I think the previous speakers uh, covered uh, a lot of what uh, I was thinking. So the first thing is that I totally agree that R can be used for uh, statistical analysis. And here, I think like one is that it can be used by, by HTA bodies. Although here, I think like as Carla said, like that perhaps the HTA bodies perhaps don't do all this type of analysis too often, not for the HCA evaluation for the other evaluations, perhaps they they do more. But I think as well, like other governmental agencies, uh, such as like our the directorate where I uh, where I work, um, which is part of the Ministry of Health, like they do quite a lot of analysis as well, and they um, uh, they can use R, which I think would uh, improve the uh, the analysis and um, um, the process. Um, also, I think that R can be used to maintain registries. So I know that the uh, Norwegian Directorate of Health uses other software for diagnosis rated uh, group, which is a system to classify his hospital cases into groups. And this is a very comprehensive process, which is a uh, computationally expensive uh, and would be I think like would be easier and more efficient uh, when using programming language such as uh, R. And I know that my colleagues have been already discussing that, although like the process of moving uh, the whole uh, um, DRG um, system to R would be for sure uh, time consuming uh, and challenging. Um, and here as well, as part of my uh, work at the directorate, we also do other evaluations uh, which are cross-sectional, so more like cost-benefit analysis, um, which are not uh, for the HTA uh, purposes, but uh, more for pro preventive interventions. Um, and here, I, I think that R could also play an important role because we, either for the calculations or for developing a model to, uh, to do the uh, cost-benefit analysis. Um, so I think those are perhaps the three additional roles that I can uh, identify, even though they were uh, covered uh, mostly by the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalia. And I think it's really important to, to understand actually that work that the that it's been done in, in maintaining those registries because that will help actually link more e easily and integrate any real world evidence analysis that will be needed. And I really found interest in the cost benefit analysis for policy purposes. So that's uh, that's really one of those examples beyond HTAs and beyond those analysis for HTA purposes. So thank you for so much for that. Let's now move to the last question that we have in the panel for you today. And um, for this one, uh, I would like to discuss with you all what is the role of artificial intelligence to develop our code for HTA purposes. And um, for this one, I will start with Arthur. The floor is your Arthur. Okay, so you've left me a really fun one to discuss at the end here. So <laughs> thanks very much. Um, I think, so this is developing very quickly, right? And I think Potentially, there's there's several organisations now that are starting to investigate the kind of cost, you know, what the kind of benefits and the risks of, of adopting these kinds of things. I mean, I suppose my instinct is to be very cautious, right? I mean, it really is developing very very rapidly here, um, um, you know, and even in the last you know twelve months. And the obvious example of this, which is you know kind of captured the public's imagination, is 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 ChatGPT. But I guess there's several large language models in the space, um, but that's maybe the most kind of well known at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, yeah, my, my overall view would be, yeah, you'd, you'd have to be kind of very careful. It does seem like there is substantial potential here to, 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 to uh, encoding. I mean, there are examples out there now already online where people have gotten, um, I think it is ChatGPT of the examples that I've seen, but people have gotten quite sophisticated models. You know, ChatGPT has, you know, from only a very simple set of prompts and ChatGPT has been able to, to, to provide, you know, a substantial amount of code. So there's clearly something going on there. Um, exactly what that is, you know, or exactly how reliable that is, uh, you know, I really can't speak to, I, I don't have any personal experience of, of using these things. Um, I can also say from my experience on the other side, not from the NCP, but just from, from a university 
you know, we're having quite a lot of discussions on the School of Computer Science and Statistics. And, you know, there's this discussion around, you know, how are we going to enforce this? You know, how are we going to check to see what students are using? And at the moment, it seems like it's sort of, uh, uh, certainly to some extent it's going to be a, a faith-based system right so, so you know i mean certainly there's, there's no way to sort of check code to see whether um uh, it's being performed or not or it's being used or not and you know unless the students do something really stupid like you know they leave in the, the kind of disclaimers that chat gpt always has at the start of every message so i mean so i think i mean certainly even if you had to the position of you know you shouldn't use it and it's a bad idea I, it doesn't seem to me like a practice that you could you could enforce that right you know if people want to use that and i think you know there have been examples now I can't think of a specific one now, but I think people are starting to use these things in practice as well. Um, so I think really what kind of, I guess the, the point that I'm coming to here is, is that what we would really need is, um, you know, um, some, some sort of testing framework. You know, what you would nearly read is, is that the company has, uh, you know, or whoever who's performed the code has some, you know, has performed some oversight over, over the code. There's some very rigorous way of checking the code to make sure that it's reliable and that it's trustworthy and things like that so so which you would hope that they would have in place anyway but maybe you know something like this coming new technologies coming through that can be used in this area really reinforces how important it is for, for that to be necessary thank you so much Arthur uh, for identifying the the opportunities and also the importance of uh, keeping an eye on what is done and being cautious so these are very good points I would like to to mention we don't have a lot of time left so maybe if we can get a relatively short view from the remaining panelists that will help to move to the concluding remarks so with this I'm going to move to Kale Kale would you mind uh, just giving us a short insight thank you Thank you, and sorry that I don't know too much about artificial intelligence, but uh, in the end, I don't think it matters who wrote the code, a person or a computer, as long as, as, long as it's well documented and transparent. Uh, I think I would think that the uh, artificial intelligence would need examples from prior models to, to come up with a new model of bit. Requested parameters, but uh, maybe as a kind of joke, I would love to see the request made to the chat GTB by the modeler. So, in the, something in the lines that I have this, I have this drug, and I wish to see this kind of results, but make it look like legit. So, <laughs> that's uh, an interesting that's, use. <laughs> <laughs> Not very that's ethical, all. I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Kale. Thank you so much for your views. Uh, I'm going to move um, now to um, Natalia, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think the result of potential in uh, NI and uh, the way it can improve HCA processes. Um, more specifically, um, AI may be used both in improving the analysis, performing more comprehensive uh, analysis. Further, um, it can also be used uh, to obtain better evidence and uh, obtain previously unavailable evidence, which can be thereafter used to inform the model and improve HCA process. However, here, uh, given the strict rules in the governmental agencies and pharmaceutical companies, I believe that the use of AI has to be structured and there is, there is a need for clear guidelines and recommendations for uh, when and how AI should be used. And I, I've seen that there are the recommendations are being developed. I've seen that uh, I think it's submitted now the guideline for reporting uh, health economic evaluation um, uh, with AI, which is I think called Cheers AI, but it's not published uh, yet, but it's submitted uh, uh, so I think like the work is being done and that's for sure having this type of guidelines and recommendations and structured process uh, is important. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, definitely very important. So thank you for your views on this. And then I'll move to Anders. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it feels really good to finalize this question because uh, it's so easy. Uh, so I'll give you the true answer. Uh, oh, I'm kidding. Uh, so. I would like to rephrase it um, and say, what is the role of science to develop our code for HDA purposes? I think it's the same thing. Um, it can be anything, nothing, or everything. Uh, and AI or science, if you're gonna use it 
for HA purposes, I mean, you need to validate it and it needs to be reproducible. Um, so it's no difference. It's just one tool and uh, like all the other science tools. So view it as that. You need to validate it and explain and show why you used that method uh, and it needs to be reproducible. So I, I don't think it's an magic uh, in AI. Um, it's the same basic rules that apply to all science when it comes to AI. Mm -hmm. Those are very good points. Again, thank you, Anders. So the, the structured approach and guidance that Natalia was talking about, and then this importance of definitely validating and, and following the science here. So thank you all. I'm going to ask the panelists to give a very, very quick uh, conclu uh, concluding remarks um, before we move to the question and answers. And it should be relatively quick so that we give some time for, for questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to start actually for this one with Kale. Thank you. So, so far, not a single model coded in R has been submitted to us. And uh, still we are eager to try. The first time we get an R model, we might struggle a bit, but I hope that we will get better and uh, to encourage the companies to submit an R model to us. We are actually considering to revising our instructions to mention R specifically as an allowed software to be used in the model modeling. And uh, I do hope that when the first model arrives, it will leave a good impression to all of our staff so they would see the benefits of uh, learning R. <laughs> Thank you, Kale. No pressure for us. We need to make a very good job on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to give the floor to Natalia now. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, so I think like just, just to conclude, there, there are a number of barriers to, uh, to use R in HDA processes. And uh, I think it's important just to identify uh, potential uh, ways to address those, those barriers and be uh, patient and uh, try to address them stepwise and don't uh, give up. Uh, and I think changing something like in practice takes time and it's just important to be uh, patient and uh, uh, work on uh, improving and like making the, the change. And I think the stepwise approach can be, can be good as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Natalia. And uh, now I'll, I would like to move to Anders. Yeah, and uh, I totally agree. We need a stepwise approach. We need, the, we need to follow um, the science. The science develops slowly. Uh, we're going to take more steps together. So let's do that. Let's challenge ourselves and see what we can do and one step at a time. So once again, I challenge you, please uh, try to submit a, a model in R and we can together evolve uh, the scientific community. Thank you so much, Anders. And uh, again, last but not least, I'll give the floor to Arthur now. Uh, okay, so yeah, again, I'd just like to reiterate my, my thanks for being uh, able to participate in, in this panel and thanks to you, Raquel, for, for, for how you, I think you, you did a really excellent job chairing. Um, so I think uh, just a really stimulate conversation. I think the, the main thing I would say, um, we haven't seen any submissions for from the NCP side. We'd be, again, to like the others said, we'd be very open to, to receiving a submission that we probably need to discuss it in advance to, to you know, to, to kind of give, to give companies some guidance over what we would kind of need to see. Um, I think as well, one thing that's kind of struck me based on our discussion is, is that there seems to be some, there needs to be some kind of consensus, right? In terms of what, what kind of is acceptable practice what sort of models are of most interest, you know, what sort of packages should probably be used, what way should, should these be built. So, I mean, I think, and I think from the NCP point of view, I think I can say that we'd be interested in, in participating more and, and, and kind of uh, investigating a research direction in that way to kind of help to, to sort of create more opportunities that way. Because it seems to me anyway, that if there's a consensus among um, HTA agencies across countries, then that, that could also be helpful as well. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the panelists because I think it's uh, it's been really good points that have been uh, brought up, and I think it's very encouraging to see that there's so much openness and so many opportunities to to start using us R for HTAs, even if in the past it hasn't been used that much. So thank you all for your views. 
I'm actually going to ask uh, James a little bit of help here because I'm going through the questions. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether there are some specific questions that haven't been addressed. So uh, have you been following the chat? Any I, question? Yeah, so I've just been taking a quick look over the questions. I think there's been some very, very sort of interesting, almost funny discussion, I would say, about the role of AI that, that prompted a flurry of comments and questions that people have had there. Um, I, I might invite Robert Smith to maybe to sort of uh, to to come on and just share some of his observations and then Howard might come back in on that. I just maybe I just invite some of the, the particular people who've been who've been commenting there and then maybe we might also go back to a question um, that that Omar asked about validating models as well. So actually maybe we should go to Omar first because I, I, that there was probably a slightly more serious discussion about amount model validation that he had asked and there were a lot of responses so i don't know if omar is, is happy to unmute himself and, and ask a question and maybe we can just rehearse a little bit of the discussion that was that was going on in the chat yeah would love to thank you thank you james um i'm asking about like i heard a lot like the validation and the standardization let's say of packages but i'm also thinking in terms of let's say the model validation itself because even if we validate, let's say, for example, packages and packages, let's say one size doesn't fit all. So maybe we need to modify to adjust the package in order to capture, for example, like the disease specific, let's say, uh, characteristic, or maybe we need to come up for, with something from scratch because like the already existing, let's say, packages are not capable of, let's say, simulating, let's say, this, this disease. So I was thinking of like about like, thinking of model let's say specific let's say uh, package or 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 let's say a um, validated model let's say in in for a specific disease in r and then we take it from there that it's already validated but also the question is who should validate or standardize should we rely on the companies pharma companies consultancy for example like or academic for example like sector or it should be for some let's say third party in between doing let's say this validation uh, procedure mm -hmm. so uh, um maybe i can provide a, a halfway of a response to this this was a topic that we discussed at a previous meeting i don't know if it was last year's or the previous years and i think i remember dawn lee maybe had particular uh, set of comments on this i don't know if she's i don't think she's on the call to, today but we did have a discussion about you know whose responsibility was this who can be trusted to go and, and do this and I think the resource questions that I think Howard raises in response and that, that you've touched on too are important about, you know, how can we expect somebody to do this? Do we have a failure that, you know, if no one has an incentive to do it, this work will never get done and, and, and so on. And I think those those questions about validation are very real. And I think it would feel like a great waste of opportunity that R may not get adopted in the way that it should do if we do not have these trusted packages and so on. And I think I can recall some interesting comments about you know, packages that were maybe widely used and quite trusted in work, but then had still come about, you know, uh, people had uncovered some unexpected problems in particular applications. So even if there's something that you everybody trusts in, 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 in practice, that maybe it's not quite as, uh, hasn't been quite as rigorously tested as we an anticipated. Um, I think we're probably at quite an expert level of user to really, you know, do the, the extreme testing to, to figure out where packages uh, fail and, and, and so on. But I, I know I've seen work where people can talk about packages failing quite dramatically uh, in, in particular instances. Um, so I, I'm trying to give a, a response in part to those questions. I, I also just wanted to kind of highlight the point that you were saying that it's not just about the package validation, but it's the overall validation, because I think that was also raised in, in reply to your, your point. Of, uh, and we, you know, we do have to make sure that we don't get naive or complacent and that we have uh, validated particular packages and so the building blocks are fine but how they're put together is, is incorrect it's, we still need to use our judgment we need to understand model structure we need to understand that we're using those packages appropriately and they're they're suitable for the particular applications and I know when we have something that maybe comes from one disease area over to another you know if you do a naive application of, of a package that's developed for a, a, a therapeutic intervention which doesn't have any interaction between patients and you take it to a an infectious disease context, then it can just be completely uh, redundant, or it would be very, very limited. So we, you know, we do still need to have that that uh, that common sense. 
Um, I, I don't know, does anybody want to sort of jump in and respond, respond any further I, to the validation issues? I can perhaps just add a little bit. I think like your responses were fantastic, James. I think like one thing that perhaps I would add is, I would believe that it's a shared responsibility. So it's perhaps not only from like either pharmaceuticals or HTA bodies or like external. Uh, I would think that this happens as well with Excel models. Like you have to be able to validate, you can model disease in so many ways. And like, I remember when I work in, in the industry, like really you could model the same disease in many ways and you have to be able to validate that and to see uh, whether the structure of the model is appropriate and uh, and whether the results whether the results make sense as well right like whether that we get from the model what kind of we would expect and uh, I think that's the same here so I would say that it's both the um, pharmaceutical companies but also the HTA bodies should be able to validate the the model and uh, assess the structure. And perhaps if there are some packages that are used that the HTA body is not familiar with, then they could request for more information from the pharmaceutical company. Those are just my like quick thoughts. Thanks, Natalia. Um, Anders, I see your hand is up, but also you had a nice comment in the chat about the risk of a non-validated uh, package versus just an erroneous model. I, I don't know, do you want to refer back to that or do you also have a novel contribution? Uh, it's... It's a development of, of that uh, response. And, I, and I'm coming from a different science perspective, having worked in pharmacometrics, where we use R a lot and other softwares. I have seen very few examples where the software or the estimator or the library actually caused er errors that would make you do a different decision. But I've seen numerous examples of where a crappy coded model produced crappy output that would make you make a bad decision. So in some kind of risk management thinking, is it really worth the efforts validating a library and say we have a perfect model or should we put our efforts somewhere else? Uh, and my, my stance is that we should put our stance, no, as our efforts somewhere else because that's um, uh, much more important when we want to make sure that we make the correct decision. Thanks, Anders. Um, Robert, Robert Smith, I see you, you put in a, a number of comments in relation to a number of different issues here. Um, I don't know, do you want to jump in on, on anything or uh, maybe even just about the, the role of, so on package validation or, or, or AI, do you, can I invite you to share some thoughts? Yeah, sure. So on, on package validation, my, co my concern about validating a package as a kind of one size fits all solution to so say maybe something like he sim or he mod and saying that this package is fine to use for anything doesn't make sense to me what makes more sense is validating functions and saying you know if you use this function to discount you know costs or qualities or something we are happy with that because we trust that function from that package and there's a whole load of things that everyone's going to do in their models in exactly the same way. And having a set of functions that are contained in packages where everyone just generally accepts, you know, if you use this function, then it's just like, like I said before in, in the previous comment, we're not going to go and validate base R's mean function. Mm -hmm. And so we can extend that general principle to a lot of simple tools that we're going to use in our in every any every model, mm -hmm. but trying to do that more broadly to kind of a whole one size fits all thing that's going to run every model for us in any disease area seems a bit ambitious to me. Yeah, I think that's a that's sensible nuance not to not to oversimplify the discussion around validation and expect that it, it solves all model problems uh, for us just because a package uh, has, has been tested. Okay, um, I'm sorry to be doing this in a somewhat unstructured way, Raquel, but I, I don't know if there are, are further comments on the role of AI um, I saw one very use, amusing comment uh, from Howard saying that ChatGPT is already plagiarizing some of his code back to him. Um, so, I mean, obviously that's, uh, Howard, you must have a lot of it that's already in the public domain that you see that happening. I would be most flattered uh, to, to see that happen. Um, I don't know, Howard, do you, do you have any um, 
does it prompt any sort of more, more serious uh, concerns uh, other than being you know having your work recognized by skynet uh, you know is there is there anything else that you're uh, that, that you that you feel sort of comes out of this as, as a concern have you have you seen any of your own code back you know inappropriately or uh, with with, with a, not not with quite the application that was intended well uh... My experience with ChatGPT is limited to experimentation and seeing, uh, could you build me a Markov model for this? Or how would you speed up this code? And often it comes back with something that looks very familiar. Um, but I think that is, as Rob was saying, there's a limited supply of these models on GitHub and that's where ChatGPT gets its information. Mm -hmm. But this happens even without AI. Um, and we, we put our code on GitHub so that others can use it. And if ChatGPT then filters those models to users to help them learn how to implement a, a model in R for the first time, then I don't see it as an entirely negative thing um, that R code has been used in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I could see plenty of, so you're saying you've, you've used it in sort of almost sort of test applications. One thing I had been thinking would be to, to you know, I, I know I've seen people describe AI as, as glorified uh, auto fill, uh, but I just, I would wonder uh, how well do these tools answer questions that are posted on, on on Stack Overflow? How you know maybe an empirical paper there waiting? You know when there's a novel question, how well does it answer? And then you know after six months of humans answering, how, you know did the answers change? And how close you know is AI to the optimal answer when it's there? So I think there's there's plenty of, of work we could do here to test how well this comes about. But that's an interesting point about yes, I suppose the incentives to put good code up onto onto GitHub in, in terms of Get the good stuff out there, and then hopefully that will improve uh, what what's there. Hey, um, does anybody have any other questions in particular they want to pose? Uh, we've got the panel here. It's a, got a group of experts. It's good to, to catch people if, if people want to ask a specific question. And unless I see hands shooting up, or I don't uh, see any questions in the in the chat. So if anyone wants to ask any answer, any question, maybe hand your um, put your hand up because I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I don't think there were more questions to answer, uh, James. Just to to so, confirm. So Robert has got in there just uh, just at the end. So um, I mean, Robert, I always think this is a bit smoother when the 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 okay. the, 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 the question opposed the question themselves. Do you want to do you want to pose it to the panel? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, nobody ever wants to to put a number to this, but if uh, if you had to guess how long until more than half of the submissions were script based, uh, so you know R, Python, whatever else, what would your guess be in in years? Long. Do you want the confidence interval on that? Because that's uh, very good. Whether we use R, because then we can actually produce some kind of confidence intervals. Uh, I'd say uh, two and a half years. Two and a half. Oh, I would say longer than that. More than fifty percent of submissions. I would say just. Uh, it's hard for me to put numbers, but I, I would say, given how long time it takes to change the practice, and that's when it comes to clinical practice as well as uh, in other. I think like there are still too many barriers. So fifty percent is, uh, um, in my opinion, would take more. Will take more than um, than that. But I'm generally optimistic. I need a number, Natalia. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, fifty percent. Oh my goodness. I I think it's yeah. It's quite odd. Fifty percent. Uh, I don't want to be pessimistic. <laughs> Usually, I'm a very optimistic person, but uh, well, I don't know. But I would say more like ten years. But that's 50%. But I'm like, I think, I hope that there will be more submissions much quicker. This I, I hope. But I think there is still, to me, the big barrier is that the global model and like the pharmaceutical, how the pharmaceuticals kind of work with that, that they have like one global model that is adapted by many countries and uh, people who adapt the model often don't have their modeling skills or strong modeling skills. They have some skills, uh, modeling skills, but not strong, perhaps enough to use R. Mm. If and I can say something. 
I, I think I'm very much aligned to Howard's <laughs> answer that I have to say that the, uh, Howard, just for everyone's information, uh, you identified 20 years. I, I guess the challenge is, I, I think there are some agencies that ve are very well positioned to take on our models, but if we think about uh, maybe agencies that are starting developing their HTA processes across the world, I mean, they are in a very incipient state to, to, uh, to develop those models, and maybe the point is how do we help them to get trained in R so that they can start developing those models in R, but there's a lot of um, expertise that is being developed, and it will take a while, particularly with uh, with some countries that are maybe starting to develop those HTA models and HTA uh, processes. So uh, that's um, one of the points we need to focus on, uh, work together, and see how we can help each other to <laughs> to improve also that use in in some other countries. But it took less than a year to develop a COVID nineteen vaccine. Yeah, that's uh, well, well, that's questionable. I think they were uh, working on that for 20 years, but uh, they they could push it forward in one year. <laughs> and we okay, have been good. working with R for several years as well, so we didn't start, yeah. start, not starting from zero there either. But there, I think we have to think about the consequences and the need that was then and here. Like we do, like having models in X. Excel works. It's not that you know it doesn't work. Like there, we can make it more efficient, etc. With R, but you know the consequences kind of not not developing models in in R are not that uh, serious as with COVID. I would say. So the incentives perhaps are not uh, as high. I think if we think about the the. Uh, case of the infectious diseases where really uh, a model in Excel is not going to be appropriate. And I think there, uh, there are other types of software that are being used because there's a clear understanding that actually Excel cannot cope with those models. So maybe we can take those learnings as well and think about, okay, what are those areas where clearly Excel is not performing well and start with those ones and move forward and, and try to get that um, agreement that maybe those Excel uh, those Excel models um, shouldn't be used in some specific areas. Can I suggest I, I, there's been yeah I think it'd be very heavy tail distribution right there's a lot of uncertainty it, it could take a long time but I, I would suggest as well that maybe the hardest part will be to get started I would imagine for some companies it, it, once they kind of make that plunge and the breakthrough I think you know going from say 10% to 20% I think Almost that will be nearly the barrier will be broken. That would be my kind of. I know why you said fifty percent, Robert, and it makes sense to think that. But I, I would kind of suspect that. I mean, I don't know. Again, just speaking from experience, but a lot of the HJs that you see, you can kind of see that there are these sort of universal models that have been developed and are kind of get modified and tweaked, right? So, if somebody, if a few, I think if kind of few key models got developed, then maybe things would really start to accelerate very quickly. So, kind of you know, you know that kind of thing that expression people have where you know. Uh, was it bit by bit and then all at once or something like that? Something like that. I, I could see something like that happening where, you know, all of a sudden this uh, kind of deluge comes or whatever. But I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, what time frame that's in was very hard to say. But it probably is a bit longer than we'd like it to be. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Anders, Arthur, Natalia, and um, Calais. It's been a really excellent um, discussion. And thank you to everyone in the comments. Sorry, not everyone had a chance to talk, um, but we will have to close the session now um, because many of us are now going to converge on York in person. Um, hopefully see many of you there tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. BST and everyone else, hopefully online, and then again on Monday at uh, one o'clock. So thank you again thank you. to everyone. Thanks, thank man. you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good you day. So Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.